This interview was recorded shortly after publishing our integration with Cohere's multilingual embedding models in Weaviate. To try this out for yourself, please check out this excellent blog post written by Sebastian Wedelek. This is linked in the description of the video. I really hope you enjoyed this interview with Nils Reimers. I learned so much as the interviewer, and I really hope you do as well. As always, we'd be more than happy to answer any questions or discuss any ideas you have. Thanks so much for watching. Hey everyone, I'm so excited about our next WVA podcast. We're hosting Nils Reimers. Nils Reimers is one of the most influential scientists in this whole area of deep learning for search. He's done so much incredible pioneering work, uh, especially with tech search. And I'll kind of hop into this, uh, the narrative as I see it, and then uh, ask Nils to kind of hop in on the origin of this kind of research. But uh, to me, it kind of looked like we started with this thing where we could extract representations of data from the intermediate layers of deep learning models and then what happened is we started optimizing directly for those representations using contrastive learning loss functions. And I think this was super successful in computer vision with papers like SimClear, MoCo, and then Nils and his team, they started showing how you could do this with uh, Siamese BERT network, Sentence BERT, and uh, developed a whole sentence transformers library, the beer benchmarks, and really showing how successful this technique could be. So uh, firstly, Nils, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so could you kind of take it on that, uh, <laughs> kind of what I left off, uh, could you kind of take over the, like, kind of the origin story of how you came to be working on uh, this kind of like Siamese encoding of representation learning? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it was not really planned that I go into that field. So back then in 2018, I've been working on clustering arguments. So in our research group, we're interested in like controversial topics, like should you still run nuclear, nuclear power plants. And we wanted to cluster um, arguments on this, like opposing or supporting and, and opposing arguments for that. And back at that time, methods were like universal sentence encoder and infrastand. Um, the big problem here was that they only released the model, like Facebook and Google only released the model but did not release any training code, did not provide like really a lot of information how to train these models. Mm. And this was like a bit, bit I don't know, was a bit annoying for me because I really wanted to have like some metal models that I can train specifically for this task. And yeah, that started to get me on the journey. How can you train the embedding models? Where I also said, okay, that's like really frustrating. You have these models, but they work really poorly out of the box for like really special scenarios like argument clustering. So I thought, okay, let's start a library um, that makes it extremely simple to train your own embedding models. At that time, BERT was recently published. So I thought, okay, let's figure out how to use BERT for clustering information. And that was like the origin for sentence BERT, sentence transformers. And from then on, since 2018, I've been hooked on the topic uh, because representing stuff in vector spaces open up so many opportunities and cool applications you can build with that. That's so interesting. Uh, yeah, I learned a lot about topic analysis from talking with uh, Martin Grutendorf on our other podcasts about BERT topic. I know he also came on uh, Cohere Talks and talked with Jay. And uh, yeah, that, that topic analysis is such an interesting point to it. Um, so maybe uh, coming into it, um, so can we start out with, so learning representations of text with deep learning, um, I'm really curious about if you could kind of tell this whole story, sort of like I know about like the whole in batch negatives, the info NCE, um, you kind of tell the story around just like your investigations into sort of how you sample positive pairs and negative pairs, model size, data size, training requirements, all these kind of things. Yes. Uh, so in the original sentence bird paper, I followed the, the approach from InfraSend. Uh, using NLI data and training like cross entry mm. and all of this, which I totally can't recommend to do anymore. So, so actually, <laughs> the original first sentence bird model performed really poorly. Um, even such, the benchmarks were really good at that time, or the, the benchmark scores were good. If you really apply them to a bit more complex data, um, they performed really poorly. They also performed really poorly, worse than universal sentence encoder at that time. So this was like really nagging for me, like, okay, how can you train better models and how can you evaluate better models? So this is like two major pillars of my research, not be justified. Hey, I got bold numbers on some arbitrary benchmark because most benchmarks are pretty bad. But first, how can you assess them that they're really good and how can you make them better? 
the influency loss when I started was a bit, it existed, but it was like really, really unknown. So the universal sentence encoder method they trained already was influency loss, or I mean, there are so many names for it. Um, but it was not really described in the paper, so it was like really hidden. And then if you follow up some some other papers, they had like really complicated formulations for influency loss. Um, and yeah, no, no training code was available. But yeah, at some point, um, with the help of a student help of mine, uh, we actually implemented one of the really old implementations of the influency loss from Google, and it showed like really good results. And then. It also made them a lot more sense than the previous cross entropy classification laws. Um, big things which are relevant here is like batch size. So that's a simple trick to increase uh, your embedding performance, increase the batch size. But sadly, at some point, you run into limitations of GPU memory. And because we don't have like an arbitrary number of GPU memories in my research lab back then, um, we invest a lot of time how to make the batches better specifically adding hard negatives to it. But here you need a lot of cleaning. So, so really you want to push anchor and positive close in the vector space and anchor and negative distant in the vector space. But this loss is extremely sensitive if the data is unclean. So if anchor and positive, it's not really a positive pair that's extremely hurting the performance. Similar when anchor and negative, when it's not really a negative, but a positive, another positive, that's also extremely hurting um, the performance of the model. So spend a lot of time thinking, working, testing. How can you make it nice and clean and have like really high quality data at scale? Uh, it's so interesting. And uh, another kind of podcast we did was with Ori Ram on uh, the spider algorithm, learning to retrieve without supervision, how um, you look for overlapping terms to form the positives. And as you mentioned, the noise and the negatives, I've always been so interested in that kind of thing. Um, so what So what are you thinking currently about the positive negative sampling scheme? Is it, uh, you know, like just adjacent paragraphs are positives? And then if you do that at scale, it kind of like <laughs> makes it all right. Um, what I'm a big fan of is like to use more powerful so-called cross encoder model for data cleaning. So Often you start with like some anchor positive pairs. These are often quite easy to, to get. Like you take scientific publications and you say, okay, the title and the abstract, that's probably like a good pair that should be close in the vector space. Or you go on um, Stack Exchange and you take a question and you take the highest ranked answer and you say, okay, that's also a good pair that should be close in the vector space. But how do you get like really hard negatives? So hard negative is, for example, I don't know, for example, you have a question, how can I sort a Python list in descending order? And then the positive would be how to do it. And the hardest negative would be to say, okay, this is how you do it, but in ascending order. So there's like a slightly tiny detail. Everything else matches, but there's a slightly tiny detail and that makes it not a valid answer. And finding this is like really, really hard. So. How can you find like a negative that's so close to the correct answer, but it's still still negative? And often you overshoot, so you get like the the a negative that's also where a person would say, yeah, that's another positive. Um, so here I really like cross encoders. Cross encoders are a lot more powerful than bi encoders. Um, to, so so you first train a cross encoder, and then the cross encoder can do cross attention between the query and or the the candidates and can really see at like these fine details, like, okay, is it like really matching all the aspects you're asking your question? And then at the end, give you like a score. And then you use this cross encoder, uh, you go over all your triplets, like anchor, positive, negative, and say, okay, here we have like actually negative pairs uh, or negative candidates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think there's a there's a bit of that that I want to unpack, and I think um, you know, being here talking to Nils Reimers, I want to just dive right into the the details of the technical questions. Um, but so maybe for our listeners, quickly, the cross encoder is this idea where you take the query and the document as input to like a high capacity transformer that will output a score, and it's slower than the bi encoders, but it's like super accurate because of the high capacity of the transformer. 
so I want to come back into the the you know you mentioned the Stack Exchange and I think the work on the one billion training pairs and then the diversity of the beer benchmarks. I think those are so interesting. I really want to come back to these topics, but quickly again, talking to Mills Rhymers, I have to ask this question. Um, what about like a knowledge distillation from the cross encoder to the buy encoder, where the cross encoder it kind of sounds like that's what you're getting at, where it's filtering the data. Could it you know have like a soft label where the score that comes out of the cross encoder is the um, yeah. uh, what the dot product should be? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm super big fan of this. So Sebastian Hofstetter established this in a really cool work where he showed how you can distill knowledge from cross encoders to buy encoders, uh, which led to the margin MSE loss, which solves a lot of these is issues. So in constructive training you need the positive to be really positive to the query and the negative must be really a negative to the query. So you spend a lot of time cleaning and trying to get like the hardest possible negative that is still a negative and not yet a positive. But with margin MSE loss, you take the triplet query positive and some other candidate, you pass it through a cross encoder to get like estimates from the cross encoder, how close are the two candidates to the query. And then you transfer this knowledge to a buy encoder. And this totally eliminates the issue of getting really clean data. So you can run it with like really dirty data, which is nice. You can run it with like really, really hard negatives so far with the, if you try and buy encoders and the negative is like too hard for a buy encoder, it extremely hurts your performance, but now you can still, still run it. So I'm a big fan. So I, in most cases, I moved away from constructive training to margin MSE training. Mm. Downside here is a bit more overhead. So constructive training, there it's like really easy to get training examples to go on Stack Exchange. You download it, you get the question, you get like 400 million questions, the highest ranked answer. So you get directly 100 million uh, pairs you can use from constructive training. But with much in MSE loss, you have to do negative mining. You have to have a good cross encoder. You have to take the cross encoder to score all query anchor, uh, query positive negative triplets. So there's like a lot of overhead involved in that. Uh, so sorry to ask a cl clarifying question, but with the margin MSC, that's where you, don't you have to kind of explicitly set the margin in the triplet loss? And I always thought for that reason, it was sort of funky, like, because it's kind of like a alpha minus max uh, kind of thing, right? So, so in much in MSE loss, you take the cross encoder, you ask like two questions, like query and candidate one and query candidate two, what's the relevance? And this gives you like two relevance. So the one has, for example, I don't know, relevance 10. The other has relevance five. And then you use this distance. So you say, okay, the, the, the distance from candidate A to candidate B is like five. And then you transform this to a buy encoder that the buy encoder, if you compute the dot product between query candidate A and candidate B should also be five in the vector space. So basically what you do is you arbitrarily pick three points. So you have the query, you have candidate A, candidate B. You ask the powerful cross encoder, what's the distance? Uh, and then you teach the buy encoder to match also the distance in the vector space. So the cross encoder teaches the, the buy encoder about distances in the vector space. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, I, yeah, I think that idea is going to be super powerful with the, because you, you want, the cross encoder is so kind of slow, especially if, you know, you're scaling to a billion documents and then maybe you want to retrieve a thousand, re-rank a thousand. So I think that kind of distillation will be super impactful. Uh, can you tell me about, I, I want to dive into the effort on uh, collecting the billion data pairs on, uh, I think it's like Wikipedia, Stack Exchange, Reddit, uh, the, like a big collection. Uh, can you tell me about the effort involved in that? Yeah. Um... So, so yeah, in last year at Hugging Phase, we had like this community event um, where we got like um, some resources sponsored by Google Cloud to work on TPUs and JAX. And there we said, okay, it would be cool to, to really train embedding models um, on a lot of training data. So far, a sentence bird model have been trained on like rather small training sets. Universal Sentence Encoder have been trained on like billions of training pairs, but sadly training was not available. So we, we put the efforts together and found like, okay, what are good resources, good labeled resources um, 
One is like, I don't know, MS Marco, NQ, all these data set, cure duplicate questions to just collect them, bring them to a standard format. And then Stack Exchange have a lot of data available, but in XML format. So it took some pre-processing time to go from XML dumps to high quality Q&A pairs. Uh, similar for Reddit, there are like some big dumps available on Reddit. So it took some time to, to process it, to get like um, comment and uh, or answer a, um, post and comment structures. And then, yeah, so, so spend a lot of time to get the data, clean the data, and then train a model. So in general, big advocate on data quality. So, so people should spend a lot of time to get like high quality data. Uh, and then truly the, the models you apply and the methods you apply is like rather straightforward after that. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, the contrastive learning is self-supervised, like the autoregressive predict the mass token. And so I think maybe the focus on data quality is less so because the philosophy is like we're taking advantage of all this unlabeled data. So can, can you maybe tell me a little more about how you think about data quality in the self-supervised thing where you have just the crazy amount of data? So how do you clean it? Do you deduplicate it? Um, yeah, so, so in general, what we see that data quality is, is critical, like in every aspect, be it like generative model or an embedding model. Um, what works nice is often like a two-stage approach. First, you, you train with some approach um, on like noisy data, like you take a bird network and you run mass language modeling on like a lot of data, um, or you, you run like this inverse closed task on a lot, like, lot of data, so where you take like a paragraph and randomly take a sentence from this paragraph, and then this is your pair. But what's really critical is um, the second stage where you train it like on high quality data for the task you want. Mm. And here data quality plays like an extremely critical role. So out of the box bird with MLM or ICT train doesn't work well for search. Um, but if you then show like some search examples, uh, you can get really good strong results. and. Yeah, I think it's valid. You can focus on both. So first pre-training or for more on the fine tuning step. I don't have a git, I don't have an intuition which is more important. Should you more focus on the pre-training or should you more focus on the on the, the fine tuning, I would say. Me personally, I've spent more time on fine tuning and, and tried to find like high quality question answer pairs or triplets to, to fine tune then the model on this. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I, I definitely want to dive into the new Cohere multilingual model and see what details I can tease out of you. But um, with the, the sentence transformer, all mini LM, that's been a just super impactful model. It has an incredible zero shot kind of ability. Is that the, that's the pre-trained model, correct? And it hasn't been fine-tuned yet. So it's like the pre-trained on massive No, the, the all mini LM model has been pre-trained on these like billion pairs, like question answer pairs, duplicate questions, and so on. Very interesting. And yeah, I think, uh, yeah, the, the zero shot ability of those models to encode all these domains, I think that's a, just a huge thing. Um, in our last podcast, Chris uh, Dossman had said that, uh, like a lot of these tools are like a, the perfect MVP minimum viable product tool that it solves like 80% of the cases out of the box. And I think it's a very interesting as we talk about this kind of philosophy of fine tuning. So I think this would be a great topic to kind of pivot into the philosophy of Cohere's models. And as you're developing these super powerful models, um, how you're thinking about pre-training and fine tuning and generally anything you want to talk about. <laughs> sure. So yeah, at Cohere, we recently launched uh, our multilingual embedding model um, this week, Monday. So, so, so far we have like these really large data set collections in English. So, because in English it's easy, you go on Stack Exchange, you download the XML files, and then, yeah, you have to do the hard work to clean or extract data from the XML files. But at least you have the, the big dump of Stack Exchange. And this gives you already like 100 million question answer pairs. So, if you train a model on this, performs extremely good. Uh, so far, an issue with multilingual models has been data. Uh, some people previously used like machine translation to translate MS Marco to other languages. But here the issue with multilingual models is that they learn 
a US-centric machine translated view on topics. So for example, in MS Marco, big topic is like, how do I do my taxes in the US? <laughs> so if I do this and take it with machine translation, translate it to German, uh, the model learns in German, how do I file my taxes in the US and how, how do I file certain forms? <laughs> but it has like a blind spot. How do I do my taxes in Germany? And me as a German German speaker, I want to do know how do I do taxes in Germany and how do I fill in my, like certain tax forms in Germany? And so this was like a big missing spot of these of a lot of previous models. Also, most previous models only worked on like sentence level, which like really bad for search where you often want to match like a query to like a long, long paragraph or longer document. So here we took like the same recipe as described before. So we first collected a lot of data from the web. So found like a lot of resources, like tens, tens of thousands of these, uh, websites, communities, FAQ pages on, on websites, news articles, and so on. And then try to find like quality or training pairs in here, like question answer pairs, basically. And um, did a lot of filtering to really filter out um, high quality question answer pairs. Here, big challenge is like to scale to a lot of languages. So mm -hmm. in English, there's like a way how you can look at like, okay, what's like a good, good pair. What's a bad pair. You can do like some regex, some filtering. Like I can, for example, I don't know, you count the number of white spaces to mm -hmm. see if a paragraph is well formatted or is just like some random string. But the challenge is if you do it across 100 languages, it's like so diverse. So for example, if you go to, to Chinese, you don't have like white spaces. So how do you know if a text is like actual proper Chinese text, or is it like just some random Chinese words? And so somehow you have to find like ways to, to scale to these 100 languages. And then the third step was like data augmentation, finding good hard negatives, cleaning them and then taking these triplets and try train the embedding model. And yeah, overall we got like 900 million English triplets, uh, close to 500 million non-English triplets, and then passing this to a model, which gives you again, like a model that has seen a lot of topics. You can apply it to Texas or online gaming or beauty or fashion or computer science. Because likely in these 500 million non-English questions, it has seen, seen such a topic or similar topic already. Uh, it's so interesting. Uh, there's so many things I want to unpack. I mean, yeah, first I think um, there's also this uh, miracle benchmark that's going around on multilingual. And I think that's about, oh man, I'm trying to guess now, but it's not, I don't think quite 500 million if you sum total all the languages other than, than English. And I know it's 32 million English. So it sounds like yeah, a massive data set. And that's, this is kind of the thing I wanted to get a little more into with this kind of private models, public models thing is uh, I think with the private models and the kind of business model around it, it makes sense. It makes sense that, you know, coherence or say open AI on the other side of the fence can build these like massive data sets and, and be kind of incentivized to build it and have a sustainable thing around building 900 million English, 500 million, sorry, uh, non-English pairs. Um, so maybe could you talk more about just like the challenges of collecting data when building the sentence transformers project compared to now at Cohere? Um, so yeah, I mean that the challenges are really similar. So you have to do work which is for a lot of people painful. So a lot of people don't enjoy working on data. So people want to find the best loss function and try to, I don't know, or add some skip connections to it. But people do not really enjoy working on data, like download this or find like all these XML files from Stack Exchange, for example, open the Stack Exchange format, pause it, find the right pairs on this. So, so people do not really enjoy this, but I think that's where a lot of value comes from. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you process a lot of data, it also requires a lot of compute. So that's that's true. That's cannot be neglected. Mm -hmm. So if you have like a billion training pairs and you want to train on this, this takes a lot of time, but also data cleaning. So we, we pass like these billion training pairs through a cross encoder. Um, 
So first you have big cross encoder, and then you need to do like inference on a billion pairs. So this also mm -hmm. takes a significant amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, that's super interesting. And um, yeah, there's that, that whole thing is really interesting. I want to kind of come back into the multilingual thing and uh, something that's always scared me with multilingual is kind of, as you say about the Chinese, you don't know when the, like, the white space or say the period heuristic or like the uh, line break for paragraph heuristics, all that is so useful. Um, and, I, and I'm also jealous of, say, the Europeans. Um, I know at Semi, say, uh, Bob and Eddie, and they all speak multiple languages, whereas me, I only speak English. Uh, so, d like, with the multilingual, do, what, what was your uh, interest in diving in? Do you have any hesitancy on maybe the domain-specific thing, like debugging your Swahili model, right? It would be a little, like, difficult. Yeah, that's that's definitely hard to, to debug this. Um, first... I would say there's like a big, big need for this. So me as a German speaker, I mean, it's always nice if I go to English, there are like so many models and systems available. But if you, even if you go to German and German, I mean, it's still like a high resource language, has a decent amount of population. It's quite powerful economically, but still the number of things you can get is like really limited. And it's like really, frustrating to see that in English you can build these amazing semantic search systems which works extremely good for Q&A retrieval but even if you go to German there's like hardly any models available and then if you go further down the the language ladder to like more and more low resource languages it's getting harder and harder to build this second motivation is multi building multilingual search with lexical search is like really painful um, so, so if you build this in Elasticsearch, for example, you need to know the language. Uh, so you need to know the language of the document. For every language, you have like a different index um, because every language requires a different tokenizer, requires a different stop word list, requires a different stemmer. So at the end, let's say you want to target, I don't know, European Union with, I don't know, 20 languages. You have like 20 different indices in Elasticsearch. Each has like a different tokenizer, stemmer, stop word list. For each document, you have to run language identification to see is it a German document or a French document. And then the big challenge comes at query time. Is it like a German query or a French query or an English query? For some really short queries, it's like a beak. It can be English and German or French and Spanish. And so how do you query these different indices? Because a Spanish query, you have to add like a Spanish index and so on. Uh, but with dense retrieval, it's extremely trivial. So you can have just, you have just one index. You take your text, you pass it through the embedding model. This gives you some embeddings. You pass it to your dense, to your vector DB. You don't have to do any language identification, don't have to build different indices, don't have to do different stemming and stop word list. So it's like super easy to build like dense retrieval for 100 languages, which is like completely painful and impossible with like lexical search. That's super interesting. I think the, um, yeah, I, I thought the last I saw, I saw strong hybrid search results on multilingual. I'm really not, uh, yeah, it sounds the whole separate stop words. I, you know, I don't know what the stop words are in Korean. So it does, I see how that kind of domain uh, shift sounds really uh, challenging. Um, so I, I kind of want to pivot to sort of an idea I've just seen recently and get your opinion on it. Um, this thing was called, this paper was called a uh, task aware retrieval with instructions where sort of the interface is in addition to that search box, you also explicitly describe your intent. And then you have like an embedding of the intent that you would use to re-rank the candidates in a vector search way as well. Uh, so what do you think about that kind of idea? Because you mentioned the problem of Okay, I gotta understand if this query is Korean or or uh, uh, what's a neighboring language. I'm not I'm not like a great language guy, but like uh, this idea of you explicitly describe your intent as well. Yeah. Um. Yes. Yeah, so so in the beer benchmark, we have like one one data set which is really interesting. It's called Arguana. When you want to mm. find counter arguments, so you have an argument <laughs> say nuclear energy is super safe. And then you want to have retrieval to find like counter arguments to say, okay, no, nuclear energy is not safe. Obviously, out of the box models, if I search for nuclear energy is safe, finds like different entries, different arguments also mentioning nuclear energy is one of the safest energy sources. So, so there are the questions like, how can I intend 
tell the model my intent that I don't want to have arguments that are similar, but arguments that are opposing. And the paper you mentioned used this in terms of like kind of like instruct style, say, okay, find like a counter argument, nuclear energy is safe, or find a similar argument or find evidences. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice idea, especially if people want to build this into their product. So, so if you have like a search engine and you want to find some arguments with supporting and opposing evidences and different perspective. So I think it's like an easy way for machine learning engineers and uh, search engine engineers just to prepend the prefix and say, okay, now I want to search for opposing arguments or uh, supporting evidence or opposing evidence for this. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of, there's a few, I kind of want to stay on this idea of, well, I think cause we could go into like the kind of the prompting and the chat GBT and that idea of instructions and intent and the interface around it. But I kind of want to stay on this like vec multi-vector search, ve like vector re-ranking. Uh, have you had a chance to see the Colbert idea and do you have any thoughts on it? This kind of like, you keep token representations to re-rank yeah. in a vector search way? Yes, yeah, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm quite familiar with Cobert. Um, so yeah, Cobert is, is a nice idea. Um, so far, challenge with Cobert is like deployment costs. So, so the idea of Cobert is like you take a text and you don't encode it to, to a single embedding, but you take every token and you met it to like like to, to an individual embedding. And this gives you like kind of like an explosion of embeddings. So if you take a paragraph with 100 tokens, it's not results in like single embedding, but to 100 embeddings. And this down the line ex lets the, the cost for the vector DB to, to be exploded. So because the cost of vector DB is like 100 times higher, and this is like really significant. So if you want to do semantic search, vector search on English Wikipedia, it's not too big. It's like, I don't know, 5 million articles, but you pay like roughly $2,000 a month to, mm. to run like AWS instance on this. If this is like 100 times higher, so that's like um, like 200K a month to run like Cobert, like out of the box, non-optimized Cobert. Mm. So search is not, not only like finding a good system, but always perfect trade-off, like good systems versus cost to run the search. And here's like interesting to play around with like different parameters to say, okay, for which setting, which provides like the optimal setting, optimal trade-off between cost and performance. Um, and I think here finding like generic answers is like really hard to say, okay, I don't know, Cobert is always better or dense embeddings is better or sparse embeddings is better. Cause I think it can also depend where you are. Do you have like a small data set and one really high quality, then Cobert is good. If you have a massive data set uh, and you're okay with somewhat good quality, then Cobert is probably like way too expensive and you you have to use like other approaches like binary embeddings. Mm, that, yeah, there's a lot. I, I, I'm still reading this paper from uh, Christopher Potts and, and a big team. I just remember uh, that name, but um, about like the the cost trade-offs of like Splayed, starting with BM25 is the cheapest thing and then like Splayed and then they, they have this like played engine behind Colbert. But yeah, I this general topic around the cost of the search systems is so interesting as we're at Weviate releasing uh, like disk ANN and the Vimana thing compared to HNSW that has the in-memory thing and, uh, you know, the product quantization, these things around uh, making it run with say CPUs, GPUs. I'm also very interested in a company called Neural Magic that's doing like sparsity for the model acceleration. That whole topic is so interesting. And uh, so maybe transitioning, um, the last time I heard you uh, give this lecture, uh, you, you, it was a really great lecture, Cohere Talks, um, and you had four key points. And I kind of want to walk through them. And I think this would be, so from uh, Colbert, I want to talk about uh, sparse vectors. I don't really, I don't know if Colbert is quite a sparse vector idea. It's kind of that idea where you have like a representation of each token. So I, I kind of want to talk about um, like BM25, Splayed, the, this idea that, that you have like a mass language modeling head that projects the token into a sparse uh, representation. Uh, yeah. So can you tell me how you're thinking about sparsity these days? Um, I, I like the Splate model. I'm a big fan of it. Um, I really like it because it's like really close to mass language modeling. So, so the issue with dense embedding models 
if you train bird MOM, gives you like really bad dense embedding models out of the box, weaker than averaging word to vec. But this MLN objective in Splate is like really closed between like Splate and MLM. You take a word, you see, okay, what are possible synonyms here? And then you put all these possible synonyms for every token into like a sparse vector. So here you have like a really close match between fine tuning and pre-training, which is extremely nice. Um, also, they have shown really strong results on like out of domain. So a big challenge for dense embedding model is like new words so people create like new new things like i don't know chat gpt mm -hmm. um pre-trained dance embedding model has like no idea what it is <laughs> but like okay. sparse models they just projected to like new dimensions you can search for it so as soon as you search search for it you find it which solves a lot of issues um topics which i'm really interested in which they sadly also don't solve is like long document encoding Mm -hmm. So Splate works on a paragraph level, so, so maybe up to a few hundred words. But in most cases, you have like really long documents, like thousands, tens of thousands of words. I don't know, in some industry, manufacturing, settling, you have PDF documents of 10,000 pages, how to repair some, I don't know, machine. And they have the question, like, how do you, can you encode these long documents? and Sadly, it doesn't work with Blade and also doesn't, in principle, work with like like sparse vectors. From guiding my thinking with these four things, I've kind of started to put long documents and multi-discourse uh, kind of together into the same category where, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, long documents is such an interesting problem. I think with the chat GPT and, and like the dialogue models particularly, it's making a lot of people think about this. So here's maybe what I've been thinking about, and I'm really curious what your thoughts are on this, is, um, is sort of clustering the windows and then because you embed the windows of the long document and then you kind of cluster it and then you have sort of a representative centroid that you kind of try to pack into the context window sort of and maybe also in addition to you know the retrieving facts and it's some kind of prompt design to overcome the long document limitation yes yeah, so i think here, like you, you need to differentiate between these two things, like more chat GPT, where you operate on like some history and in terms of, of retrieval. So, so in terms of retrieval, um, big challenge is kind of like co-references. So, so if you take the annual report from Apple, you just have like Apple on the front page of the annual report. So the annual report is like, I don't know, 200 pages long. And then down the line on the paragraph level, it just says we. So instead of like Apple, they just we. And you can have a paragraph where they write like, we saw a big increase in demand for all our products in this market. And there the question is like, what is we? What is our products? And what is this market? And you as a human, you know, okay, it's the Apple annual report. You're in subsection, I don't know, iPhone sales in North America. And then you can fill in like the blanks, but there are the questions like, how do you fetch up this code co ref or how do you fetch up this information? Um, in chat GPT challenges, um, here, what works so far is like increasing the context length, because I don't know if you start a blank session, um, it, it takes some time. So if it has like context length of 8,000, so, so right now the best models can do like up to 8,000 word pieces. That's like eight pages. So it takes a time until you write like eight pages of conversation with ChatGPT. So you can just do massive attention of all tokens. But probably over a long time, if you really build up, I don't know, if you have like a lot of interaction with systems, we need to find ways to, to build up some type of memory. So like we do it with humans, we know this person, I don't know, has these hobbies, this work, these i don't know travel to this location and then we can query this somehow and use this in our current context so so either we have to find like way to build up like some small memory which we can quickly efficiently query or we have to do have to have so like some query thing into it like okay um on what topic is the person working so so that I can create like a follow-up question on this. But still that's I don't know, really I think really early feel like how can the a system 
quickly access memory and build on top of this to get like new ideas from past history. Yeah, it's, I mean, the whole external transformer memory idea is something that we're just crazy excited about with Weave 8 and the, you know, the vector index and all that. But um, I really quick, I want to go a little deeper into this co-reference resolution. It's it, it sounds like such a problem and it, I think it communicates the idea well. So like three paragraphs or uh, eight pages. Well, let's, so in the context of retrieval models, we're saying we can only take in like two paragraphs as input. It's so like four yeah. paragraphs ago, it said like, uh, yeah, Apple is the, and then we are, and then we is Apple. So does that mean we maybe need like a co-reference resolution parser to parse our text before it's vectorized? Or do we maybe need to create like a graph of edges that link? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. Where we're currently doing research on it, um, so so it depends kind of the the data set. So right now, a lot of people work on Wikipedia, but Wikipedia is kind what kind of boring because it's like really self uh, contained. So if you take a paragraph from Wikipedia, I don't know, you take a random paragraph from the Barack Obama article, it will mention Barack Obama. So like every paragraph mentions Barack Obama. But in every reports, they, I don't know, Apple just say we. And then on the front page, you know, it's Apple Android reports. You go on page 100. Here's a section about, I don't know, iPhones. And then page 150 is iPhone sales in North America. Mm. And then you have the paragraph like, we saw a big increase for our products in this market. And so mm -hmm. you kind of need to do like co-reference resolution across like many pages. So potentially like going back 100 pages to know, okay, this is the Apple annual report from 21. And there's the question, like, how can we do this? Because mm. there we come back to like old problem. So right now, all people in co-reference resolution are mainly using transformer networks, which are again, limited to like, mm. I don't know, 512 word pieces. Mm -hmm. So, but how can we do this co-reference resolution possibly over like hundreds of pages and, and mm. also like a really complex setting to, so that we really know um, how to do it. And yeah, I think that the best way if we change to paragraph and encode them is to really rewrite the paragraph so that if you just see the paragraph and nothing else, mm. you have all the, the relevant context information. So mm. if I rewrite like we saw a big increase in our products in this market in the last year and rewrite it to Apple, saw a lot of increase in demand for the iPhone in the North American market in 2020, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. it's nice. You can find it for a lot of search questions. Uh, but yeah, open questions like, how do you do this rewriting? Especially this requires, again, to resolve long context uh, mm -hmm. reference resolutions. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think of that as like a data augmentation, maybe more than a pre-processing, because you're kind of trying to encode the invariance of uh, the original paragraph without, sorry, the original paragraph without the co-references resolved. And then the new kind of like, instead of we, it's Apple. And then you're trying to say like, be invariant to these two transformations. And I think it's very interesting as you kind of, the problem eats itself. Like the co-reference resolution models, they also are limited to the context. So yeah, that's a pretty yeah. interesting thing. Um, and then obviously we can also change like, I don't know, maybe they have like some subdivision and then we can mean, I don't know, not only Apple, but maybe, I don't know, Apple Europe or so, mm, or some, mm. you have like some parent company and then this is like some uh, child company. So, so we can refer to the child company or can it refer to the whole group mm. or to some product team. So H have you thought about like, um, entity parsing entity extraction it's because it's a little different from the sparse search with the high with the hybrid the bm25 is like if the query is how to catch an alaskan pollock <laughs> it's like it'll be emphasizing the alaskan pollock sort of with the keyword matching thing but there's also this idea of like entity extraction alaskan pollock and maybe it's that multi-vector ranking where you search with how to catch an alaskan pollock and then you re-rank with just the like alaskan pollock um yeah, I mean, the, the, the research is still really early in this field. So, so um, big limitation is so far data sets. Um, a lot of data sets are built on Wikipedia, which does not really require to take a lot of context into account. Uh, then the question, is it just entities or is it also other 
things mm. that are more than entities. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. also like like an open research question. Is it just fine to, to resolve like we and this and last mm -hmm. quarter, or do we have to also resolve other things? And yeah, in my experience often in these, I don't know, these these examples you make up like, I don't know, we saw a big demand. Mm -hmm. It's kind of easy, but then if you go to actual sentences, you say, okay, it's like a lot more nuanced. Which context mm. information do you still need to understand this paragraph? Um, maybe context information can also map to like a table with financial data. It can map to some graph. Mm. And then the question is like, okay, maybe they have like some pie chart and they are discussing the pie chart. How can you contextualize the pie chart into this paragraph? so that if you just include the paragraph, have all the necessary information and without running out of context links or word links again. So. Yeah, that's another really interesting topic. I think there's so many things to talk about, but like that idea of um, the tables and the graphs and getting that into the text domain, it also, it kind of reminds me of the same data augmentation pre-processing we discussed with the co-reference where, where you can parse the tables. Like I've seen this paper on a, it's like learning to reason across wiki tables, something, some title like that, where they're parsing out the tables to go from table structure to text structure. Uh, and then, cause then you kind of unify the domains without having to have like a visual uh, component to it. Yeah. Anyway, anyway so um, another topic, uh, kind of a finishing on the four things is, um, uh, so the topic of uh, unknown words and distribution shift, um, maybe kind of, maybe actually those are kind of two topics with, um, because uh, maybe we'll start with uh, distribution shift because it's so exciting. So uh, <laughs> I recently read this paper that was really interesting called OOD Disk ANN, where they're describing the distribution shift in if you build up an image index and then you're searching with the text queries, they're going to be out of distribution for the HNSW prox or the proximity graph structure is, is the Vimana, but and that kind of idea. So uh, how are you thinking about distribution shift these days? Yeah, so, so distribution shifts are interesting on multiple aspects so so language evolves so 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 that's big pain point of language or nice feature of language um, you you see that things evolving in meaning so i don't know like corona before 2020 it was like many beer then suddenly in 2020 if someone talks about corona it's connected to, to a virus Similar, if you talk about like Alpha, Beta, Omicron, it used to be some Chinese, uh, some Greek characters, maybe relevant for mathematicians. Now people talk about, yeah, there's like a new Omicron wave in, in Europe or stuff like that, or there's a new Omicron variant. It's like extremely hard to, 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 to really update the models here. And a big challenge is also um, in terms of like first stage and second stage retrieval. So, so if you take an embedding model, it has like no idea about coronavirus. Maybe on new training data, you can update the model that corona now has a new meaning. But then you come back to need to think about like, do you need to re-encode your whole corpus? So you do you have to take the embedding model and re-encode like the whole corpus? If your corpus is small, like a million documents, it's okay. But if your corpus is the web, like Google or Bing, you have to re-encode like all documents on the web just to create like the new embeddings. And so there's like an interesting thing or question like, okay, can you make this a bit more efficient? So, so which can you kind of like transform the embeddings? So do can you do like some partial updates? So do you can just update that Corona now has like two meanings, the beer and the virus? And can you find like the documents you want to update, but everything else you can keep the same? Um, be able to decide when do you do the updates or when do you train again this new embedding model and so on. Um, so, so many, many open unsolved research questions here. Right now, people do like the most stupid thing. They completely update the embedding model and then encode the whole corpus again, even such that 99% are completely untouched from, from the update. So, so exciting research questions to know, okay, what do you need to update and how can you update this? And also there the interplay between first and second stage. So maybe it's okay to have like an outdated first stage retrieval that does not really know what is Corona, but then have like a more recent up-to-date second stage retrieval that knows, okay, Corona can also 
uh, mean a virus now and not only a beer. Yeah, I thought what you just said was incredibly inspiring. Because uh, there's this argument about with the whole like uh, we V8 augmented GBT thing where it's like, um, you know, the big language model doesn't need, it can be updated for these new facts by retrieving it. But then it's like, well, what about the retrieval model? And, 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 it, that, and then there's that problem of you retrain the retrieval model on the new information, like the new Omnicron, uh, Omnicron uh, variant. And then, um, and then you have to re-encode in the whole document. And if you have like, you know, hundreds of millions or whatever. And we thought about this idea that is kind of interesting that I'd like to pitch to you as well is like, a, like maybe we could use that proximity graph structure as a prior to try to propagate the representation space changes. And, and that way we can maybe only re-vectorize like 10,000 documents and it could be, they could be kind of cleverly selected with their kind of centrality in the proximity graph. And then we could maybe have some sort of graph neural network that could propagate representation changes. I don't know if this is too grandiose of an idea. But, uh, <laughs> do you, what do you think about that idea? Um. I think that there, there you quickly run in the problem or in the challenge to know what has changed. So, so let's say what has changed in 2022. And then maybe for some top things, you can name it. But it's like really hard in the long tail to say, okay, what has changed? Mm -hmm. like, are there like new, in some new online games, popular online game, is there like some new patch which introduces new characters which have like a new acronym and now everyone refers to them with like a different acronym or so so i think mm -hmm. that's like the, the the challenge like really what has changed between now and the year before and to really enumerate this to not only say okay not only like i don't know corona changed the meaning but like really in the long tail what has all changed the meaning and where do you all need to do the update Mm. I think that's that's the biggest challenge, how to automate this and how to find it. Um, also, in terms of preferences, um, if I search for, like, how can I get corona, in theory, how I catch the virus and how I catch, well, how I buy the beer should both be relevant. So if you ask, like, an annotator, they should both be annotated as relevant. But probably if you see a search in like Corona and people say, how do I get Corona? You probably mm -hmm. want to rank the virus higher than the beer. And then maybe hopefully in a few years, you want to rank the beer high again. And then, <laughs> but there, yeah, also the question, like, how do you build up this popularity? So it's not only relevancy in search, but also popularity of terms like um, NFT popped up at some point for non-fungible tokens. So if mm -hmm. someone search for NFT, were meaning unfungible tokens, but there were meanings for NFT before. So, so there's like a book series, not for tourists, also abbreviated mm -hmm. with NFT. So <laughs> how can you learn? Okay. There's like a new meaning, which is a lot more popular. Also crypto. Um, I started myself to work on cryptography. So crypto 10 years mm -hmm. ago, when you referred to cryptography, then Bitcoin and, and uh, and so on happen. And now if you talk about crypto, everyone talks about like Bitcoin and stuff. So, yeah, I think um, in this, well, yeah, this idea of kind of updating the unknown words, it sounds, it, it sounds pretty difficult and I don't even have anything to kind of propose, but that's kind of why I also really like this intent stating as well in the search engine interface where uh, how to catch Corona. And then maybe if you just said your intent, like I'm looking for a beer, I, it's like a different way to search and it's more verbose than usual, but if it gives you better results, maybe, especially, especially with like the kind of the idea that search interfaces are moving into like generating you a long answer instead of just necessarily returning documents. Yeah. Uh, and maybe you'd be willing to put more effort into your query. I think generally the search interfaces uh, thing is evolving. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe kind of, yeah, I want to ask you that question about search interfaces really quick. Like, um, yeah, just, just, just a second one on this intent. I mean, it's kind of old idea. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't know, before that it was named query rewriting. Mm -hmm. I mean, we as a human do it like, I don't know, if I search for Corona, I get the wrong results. I search for Corona beer. So we already trained on this. Um, mm -hmm. I search for like how to sort a list and I forgot which programming language I add like Python to it. And then also in the back end, like, I don't know, even when Google was created, was smartly adding Query rewriting to it. So mm. when I look for 
I don't know, like an Italian restaurant. It was adding smartly in the background the current location I'm in, and we're looking for like an Italian restaurant in Darmstadt. So it's it's kind mm-hmm. of like an old technique, these this query rewriting, adding, trying to guess the intent and adding it. Yeah, that's super. I, I saw this like learning to reformulate queries with reinforcement learning, where the action space is are the keywords, and then you can add them, subtract them, boost the importance of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's super cool. I, I guess I'm kind of uh, losing interest in that idea due to the challenge of maybe a reinforced and learning query writer. It sounds like a lot of overhead in the <laughs> in the search pipeline thing. Yeah, true. Sure. Yeah, so interesting. Uh, so anyways, Nils, uh, thank you so much for joining the WeVA podcast. I think we covered so many interesting topics. I'm really looking forward to rewatching this and you know rethinking about all these ideas. Um, thanks so much for your contributions to search broadly. Uh, and I'm really loving these uh, Cohere talks you're giving. Uh, I think you're doing another one in about an hour. And, <laughs> and, uh, so I'll see you over there. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And thanks again. Great. Thank you so much for being here. Bye-bye. <laughs>